When I went to Saudi Arabia, I realized that my senior engineer was right. Some contractors don't play fair and some intentionally trying to, to cheat. And if you don't have proper knowledge in this practice, in this engineering practice, you will be forced to sign drawings, approved materials, and even accept raw installation. And when you do that, you will be in great trouble. Especially when I'm Saudi, I'm working in oil and gas, a one spark of electricity, it will burn billions of billions of oil and gas facilities. So this is the same reason why Paul gave instruction to Timothy to study God's word thoroughly because there will come a time when people will no longer follow the proper teaching of the Bible. This letter was written during Paul's second imprisonment in Rome, and if Paul died uh, 67 AD, according to historian Eusebius, our church father, probably uh, this letter is written around 65 to 67 AD. And this letter is addressed to Timothy, his son in faith, as mentioned in uh, chapter 1, which probably you already heard. And this epistle is known as pastoral epistles together with first epistle, uh, first Timothy, and uh, together with Titus. Because most of the subject are pastoral responsibility. This letter was written in a time when Paul felt that he was about to face death. And it seems more of a passing of a baton letter to his son in faith, Timothy. He is now entrusting the ministry to Timothy. And Paul wants to tell Timothy that when he preached the gospel, the word, he will face opposition even from the very people whom he know is with him. And these people will even persecute you. But he encouraged Timothy to take heart for the Lord is with him. And that's why our main point on this text is preach the word in the midst of suffering. The Lord is with you. Preach the word in the midst of suffering for the Lord is with you. Three lessons we can learn from this passage. First is trust God's word even the world, the world persecutes you. Which covers the whole chapter 3, verse 1 to 17. Second point is preach the word, even the world will not listen to you. Which covers chapter 4, the first half until verse 8. And preach the word, even the world will abandon you. Which covers chap uh, verse 9 until the end, verse 22. Preach the word, even the world will persecute you. Our first point. Paul, Paul said, in the last days, there will come a time of difficulty. As he stated in verse 1, the last day, according to to D.A. Carson, is it's Christ's first coming until the end. And even uh, in the letter of our apostle John used the same terminology 
in his right in his epistle first john and he used this term to describe the expanse of time they got this idea from jesus himself when he described that the last days has already started in Matthew 24 in the Sermon on the Olivet, Mount Olives, but the final fulfillment is not yet. It will happen when Christ return. Therefore, what Paul meant is in the last days, the last days have already started but not yet the final end. Paul described that in the last days, which is now the present time, evil characteristic of men will be more evident. The main effect of our fallen condition is we no longer love God. And if we no longer love God, we look for someone to love. And who do we love most? Correct. Ourselves. When we love ourselves, we become proud, arrogant, conceited, abusive. When we prioritize ourselves, we become disobedient, hurtless, and a pleasable slander, treacherous, lovers of pleasure, as stated in our verses, verses 1 to 6. This fallen nature of ours are started in the Garden of Eden when our first parent, Adam and Eve, started to love themselves the loving God because of sin. Then Paul mentioned verse 5, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. What does it mean? It means that the person is acting like a Christian but his life does not reflect the character of a new born again or a new believer. And without, because there's no power in the Holy Spirit in his action, he, like, he acts like a Christian, but uh, like he likes, uh, he attends going to church every weekend having Christian friend, uh, friends and even love church activity. But at the back of these religious activities, he is doing some horrible things like illicit relationship and forgiving heart, humanizing, internet pornography, uncontrolled drug, drinking habits, not truly praying, and not, and don't have time for meditation with the Lord every day. Paul said, avoid such people. Why? Because there are contagious nakakahawa to other true believers. He is luring other believers na naakit to fall into sin kagaya, just like him. So be careful of this kind of people within the church. And if you are that man, pray to the Lord for forgiveness while there is still time. It's better to repent for 1,000 times or more than to be burned in the lake of fire forever. Brothers and sisters, without the power of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life, 
no one can survive to be holy in this world. Now in verse 6, these men mentioned are not truly Christians. They are pretending because there is a, that they're like an evil opportunity, opportunist within the church. They are pretending to be good. They have good charisma. But they have their own evil agenda. And one example given in our passage is they capturing women in the church. These women become weak because of their situation. They become old, separated, and having financial difficulties. Now in verse 8 and 9, Paul set an example during the time of Moses. The name Janes and Jabres were not really mentioned in the Old Testament. But Paul used this name according to Jewish tradition. These two guys, these two men are Pharaoh's two sorcerers. They're, they're the one who challenged Moses as Moses performed miracles in front of the Pharaoh. This described in Exodus chapter 7, verse 10 to 12. Theologians said that Paul get this name from Targum. Targum is a rabbinic literature full of legendary lore, which is mostly uh, not true. After Paul described the fallenness of this world, he reminded Paul that Paul, uh, sorry, Timothy, you're a good guy because you are following my footsteps. My belief, my attitude, my purpose, my perseverance in faith, even to the point of death. And Paul mentioned places where he experienced persecution. And Paul know this place because he was a witness on these things. And sometimes he's part of the persecution. Church, all who desire a godly life will be persecuted. All who desire a godly life will be persecuted. As mentioned in verse 12 and 13, persecution will come. That's a guarantee. It's not, I'm not discouraging you, but that's what our verse said. And in so many verses in the Bible. The reason of persecution that as you grow in your Christian walk, as you become more like Christian, as you follow the teaching of the Bible, people will hate you. Why? Because biblical principle is totally different from the principle of this world. And as you become more faithful as a Christian, the more you contradict the principle of this world. And in some way, those affected in your righteous walk will be guilty and will persecute you. For example, if your friends or office mate invited you for a, a night hangout or a drinking session or inuman and you refuse, there will be backlash for your righteous action. Either they will no longer consider you as friends or sometimes you will hear hateful words like wala namang pakisama yan eh this guy has no cooperation or maybe baka uh, hindi lalaki yan maybe he's not a guy and so other hateful words 
Have you experienced this before? Another thing is, when you share the gospel to your friends, office mates, family, relatives, you will face criticism by your faithful action. They will laugh at you at the back, they will think you're a fool, they will call you names, and worse, they will find the slightest mistakes of yours so that they can dis discredit your credibility. So that when they hear the gospel, they have reason not to believe. Brothers, if this is you, continue to be faithful even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of persecution. Do not lose hope. Do not give up the faith. Do not avenge yourself but instead rejoice rejoice because James said in chapter 1 count it all joy my brothers when you meet trials of various kinds for you know that the testing of your faith produce steadfastness and let steadfastness have full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Brothers and sisters, rejoice in the midst of suffering. Be discipled by someone who is faithful, as implied in verse 14. Discipleship means that sitting with someone whom you look up to as a spiritual guide, approach him or her and ask her, him, can you disciple me? Then learn how he became faithful in his life. How he became faithful in the Lord and follow it. Learn his theology, his manner of life, how he handled problems, his struggles, and even his family. This what Timothy did to his teacher Paul. Most mature believers that I know, before they become faithful in their lives, they have gone through immense trials and suffering. And the more you became faithful of that man, the one training you, the more you will be surprised and find out that God uses broken people for his kingdom. But why? So that God will only get the glory. The more you matured in faith, the more you understand what I'm saying. Teach your children the Word of God. Verse 15 states that it is the way to salvation. Teach your children the Bible because the purpose of the passage said, as the passage said, will make your child know how to be saved. It doesn't mean that you can save your child, but when the right time comes, when someone presents to him the gospel, he can easily understand and able to connect the dots, the redemptive purpose of the Bible, which is from beginning to end, it is the grand story of God's redemptive plan to save his chosen nation. And the climax of that story is Jesus Christ. Because He is the only way to salvation. Buy children Christian books. Ask your wife in the Philippines to, to buy Christian books as guide in teaching. Make sure that your kid, kids enjoy it. Teach your child 
children stories in the Bible in his own level of understanding and always and always relate the story to Jesus Christ for all scriptures is written about him when my child was still young kids my still young once a week we have Bible study in our house my wife is the narrator and I'm the one explaining the theology and the most important part is the gospel implication of the story and when they grew up they did not depart from it I remember two years back when our GTC seminary uh, conducted training one of the university student leaders approached me and asked are you the father of are, are you the father of David Reyes and I said yes and then he shake my hands and he said my son is is so encouraging in the university Christian fellowship so as my daughter in other university here in Dubai this student leader said, I'm wondering where my son get his deep theological understanding. And now, he knew, he said. When I heard that thing, I almost cried and thank God and worship God because it's a miracle. Because honestly, when I'm teaching my kids when they're still young, I'm not even sure if they understand it. I'm not even sure if, if they're getting it because when I'm teaching them, especially my uh, son, he just stumbling on the sofa, playing around as if he's not listening. But when they grow up, it shows in their life. That's why brothers and sisters invest time with your kids about heavenly matters. It might look that they're not getting it, but when they grew up, it will show in the way they speak and walk in life. Why? Because the word of God is active and powerful. In verse 16, it says that all scripture is God's bread. Some Bible translation use the word inspiration to describe its meaning. I think this description does not justify its true biblical meaning because nowadays, especially nowadays, inspiration usually use like I, I want to paint I, I'm inspired and uh, for a writer I'm inspired I want to write and if you see your crush uh, that's my inspiration I think the more sensible world is expiration meaning out breathing of God it, it's like he did not breath the ESB translation make sense God's breath because it simply literally means God's very breath and for this reason the scriptures is considered by evangelical Christians as verbal plenary inspiration verbal because the very language in the Bible is the result of God's outbreathing Plenary means all, all of the writings. According to Dr. Bruce Ware, the very grammar, the syntax, the word that are used, every component of the language of the original writing of the 66 books is the result of God's outbreathing. But wait, 
Note that the original writing is the verbal plenary inspiration, not the translation. And for this reason, we have Bible scholars who study the original language of the Bible in Hebrew, the Old Testament, some Aramaic, and Greek in New Testament, so that we normal readers will have an accurate as possible the true context and meaning of the Bible. And I can guarantee you that our present Bible we're using now is 99% accurate and the 1% is you, you just look to other translation. But at the same time, it is true that the Bible is written by men, each one of the book. But nonetheless, behind all these 66 books in the Bible, there is one author, one divine author. It is God who breathed the scriptures. In verse 16 to 17, Paul states the purpose of the scriptures. This is for teaching about God to serve as a proof of what our Christian belief is and for correcting believers if they fall into sin and for correcting unbelievers of their wrong understanding of the scriptures. Because the scriptures, one of the major function is to serve as our training manual for righteousness. Brothers and sisters, trust the Bible for your Christian living and trust His words in time of and of times of trials and suffering. <coughs> After Paul established the credibility of the scripture, now he command Timothy to preach the word, the, the scriptures. Preach the word, even the world will not listen to you. The imperative command to Timothy, I charge you, I charge you, he said, God is my witness. And the command is, Preach the word. Timothy, I charge you, God is my witness, preach the word. <coughs> and maybe you're asking, what do you mean preach the word? Which word? The word means in this context is in previous verse. Verse uh, in first in third chapter, verse 16, the scriptures. It's written by spoken by God. <coughs> written by men as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But God's word is not which or what, but who. Yes, you heard it right, who? A person. Because in the beginning of creation, as said in John 1, the word already existed. The word was with God because the word was God. Now notice he, a person, was in the beginning with God. It means the word has equal standing with God because the word was God. And then in verse 14, Apostle John explained that the word became flesh. He defined it more. The, the, the word became flesh, became man, and dwells among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And after two verses, John nailed it. In verse 17, grace and truth came through 
Jesus Christ. Therefore, Jesus Christ is the reincarnated Word of God. And this Word has the power to change your life. And in fact, has the power to give life. We humans can change, cannot change our internal character. Only God can do that. And God uses His spoken words, which is now written in the Bible, so that He can change our heart. Our God is a holy God, and He don't want to see the presence of a sinful man in His eyes, in His front. Yet God is also loving, merciful, and gracious, and that's why he expressed his love. He spoke words which now become the Bible to change your heart and my heart. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He became man, suffered, and died on the cross to be the payment of your sin and resurrected on the third day so that we might become righteous in the eyes of the fathers. And whosoever believe in him should not perish but have an eternal life. It means that if we repent from our sins and ask forgiveness, and we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior, then the Lord will save us and forgive our sins. Now in verse 2, Paul commanded, the, the Paul command is in earth, in urgency, in season and out of season, in whatever condition is trying to say, by why such urgency? The answer is in the next verse, because the days are evil. In the last day, which is nowadays, the scriptures will no longer the final authority. The world will now water down the teaching of the Bible and use only God's word that will fit our desires, man's desires. And that's why he stayed in uh, verses 3 and 4, for the time is coming when people will not endure teaching, but having an itchy ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passion and will turn away from listening to the truth and wonders of unto me. We can distinguish what is a good sound from a bad sound. Our music ministry can attest to that. If we are familiar to one song, we know the lyrics and the rhythm. And we can easily distinguish if, if the one singing is out of tune or the words are not matching, right? So as with sound doctrine and sound teaching, if the person is not teaching according to the Bible, then it's not sound teaching. If we are not living according to God's word, then our life is not in tune with the scriptures. Paul used another figurative word, itchy ears. It means that we only listen to the things we wanted. Paul said it's like this, the time is coming when people will not listen to good teaching. Instead, we will look for teachers who will please us by telling them only what 
we want to hear. Sometimes, at night, I feel itchy in my back. So I ask my wife to, to scratch my back. And as he start, she start scratching, uh, is, uh, when he hit the spot, we, we, I feel, ah, oh, it's for comfortable, right? We are relieved with this itchy thing. Because we only want to be scratched on area where we want, right? So as in our spiritual life, we only want to listen on things what we want to hear. We only want to hear things that we desire in life. And as human, what are the things we desire in life? Wealth, good health, good life. That principle is prosperity gospel. We want to hear preaching that will inspire us. We want to hear preaching that will feel us good. But we don't want to hear preaching that will convict us from our sin. Paul mentioned another figurative word, wonders of intimate in verse 4. Because we prefer to to spend our time listening to religious story which is too long spending time on it and most of it are not true instead of just listening to the word of God then Paul gave advice to Timothy that always be sober in verse 5, Paul advised Timothy to be sober-minded. What does it mean? It means that to remain focused, serious, or straight in your thinking. We need to evaluate every time our action if this will fit to the teaching of the Bible. You know the reason why horses have covering in their uh, side of their eyes so that they will only look straight and will not be bothered around on the things on the side as they run the race. Our Christian walk should be like that. As said in Hebrews chapter 12, let us all, let us also lay aside every weight and see that clinging so closely. That's the thing on the side. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Do the work of an evangelist. Paul gave another advice to Timothy to herald the gospel as the main part of ministry. Sharing the gospel is our major calling as a believer. And one fruit of being Christian is the joy of knowing that God had saved us by grace. And because of this joy of knowing that our heart is uh, made us to share the gospel to others. But if there's no joy in your heart to share the gospel, maybe you need to ask yourself if you are truly a believer of the Lord. Maybe you're not true born again Christian. But there is still time. Repent from your sin and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Then you will have true joy in your heart. Keep the faith until the end. 
after Paul gave his final pastoral advice to to his son in faith Timothy, Paul made his valedictory address. He said in verse 6 to 8, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but all those who love is appealing. Paul completed the task that God gave to him. And he is ready to, to bow down, to put his hat on the wall. He did not only finish, he finished it with flying colors. And for this reason, he is expecting a crown of righteousness. And the good news is, it's not only to him, but all of us who waiting for the coming of the Lord. So it's for the believers. Now, note that Paul suffered so much in life. Five times he received 39 slashes. Five times. Three times beaten with rod. Stoned to death. Beaten to death. Shipwrecked. Hungry for days. Always being abandoned. Hunted. Abandoned by fellow believers. Betrayed. Accused falsely. And even in the time he writing this letter, he knows that he will face death in the hands of the Romans. But despite of all these things, there is a joy in Paul's heart. And that is why he persevered until the end. <laughs> because true born-again believers persevere. And only those who persevere in the end are true born-again believers. Paul advised to the Philippians, said, I am sure that he who began the work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. What an encouraging word. And that's why after Paul gave instruction to Timothy, he now gave his personal instruction. Our third point is preach the word, even the world will abandon you. In the last day of Paul, people deserted him. Anyone shall. And we are expecting after years of preaching and teaching in Europe, in Asia Minor, we're expecting that we, he will be a well-respected elder, pastor, apostle among the believers, well-supported financially and well-received and encouragement from others. Why? Because Paul is successful in his ministry. He's one of the most successful among the apostles of Jesus Christ. He planted so many gentle churches. He penetrated the most unreachable areas. And in fact, he is the most educated among the disciples. And yet, in the last day of his life, almost all have deserted him, even those whom he trained, except for Luke and Mark. How do you feel if you are in Paul's shoes? Sad. 
in verse 13, Paul said, uh, bring the books and above all the parchment. Probably, these books is referring to the Old Testament books. And the, the parchment are the other writings of other apostles. But this parchment, parchment is a thin material made of skin of animals, usually from goat or sheep, and used as a durable writing surface during ancient times. Notice, if we sum up the books and letters that Paul have, he has more than three-fourth of the Bible. Almost complete, complete, com, uh, complete compilation of the Bible. First, the book, the Old Testament. Luke, who write the Gospel of Luke and Apostle of Acts, which is one third already of the New Testament with respect to quantity. And Mark, who wrote the Gospel, plus Paul, thirteen letters then it's more than three-fourth of the Bible. It seems that Paul was started compiling all these canonical books and letters. Note that only after 300 years, around 300 to 480, the Bible was compiled. But Paul started to compile these books. Keep on learning God's word. Even in the last day of Paul, he is still studying the Bible. He said in verse 13 to bring the books and the parchment, the, the letters. Note that Paul is one of the best theologians during his time. And I say that he is the best theologian of all times. And yet, he still wanted to know more about God. We can study the scriptures in all our life. And yet, we barely scratches the surface. Because the Bible is the written, written wisdom of God. And it's unfathomable. Church, Church Spurgeon, Spurgeon commentary on this verse that even apostle must read. If Paul is studying the Bible, should we be more? Question is, do we read the Bible every day? Do we meditate on God's word every day? Or even just read a portion of verses every day? If that's so much, then how we Christians survive every day? How do we survive every day as Christians? God's word is our daily bread. In preaching the gospel, you will face opposition, as said in verse 14 and 15. Preaching the gospel does not end in sharing its meaning only. We, we must also need to protect the gospel from those who want to destroy its meaning. And that is the responsibility of every Christian. And that is why we need to study the Bible thoroughly, seriously, faithfully, so that when attack comes, we will know which one is true and which one are false. You know, if you go to a bank, Bank tellers are trained for many hours.
to distinguish which one, which money is paid or not. By just touching the texture of the money, even without looking, they can determine which one, which money is true and which one are fake. We Christians also be aware which one are the false gospel, who are the false teacher, and what are they saying. You need to know what are false doctrine, what are prosperity gospel means, what is more moralistic preaching means, what is inspiration preaching means, what are false prophecy means. King Charles said, Satan greatest ambassador are not pimps, politicians, or power brokers, but pastors. <coughs> False pastors. Jesus warned us, warned us on this thing. He said, Beware of false prophet who came to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. In times of persecution, the Lord will stand with you. In times of persecution, the Lord will stand with you. In verse 16, Paul said that no one stand by me, but all have deserted me. Paul said, and if you are in Paul's shoes, how do you respond? Probably you will get angry to these people and thinking that after all I've done to you, this you will do in return. And how dare you such people? But look how Paul responded. He said, may it not be charged against them. Whoa! But why? Because Paul confidence is in the Lord and not on his circumstances. Paul's confidence is in the Lord and not in his circumstances. He said, But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. In verse 17. This attitude should set an example to us. Don't depend on your success in your ministry, how many people you bring in the church, your position in the church, your role in the church, and even how deep your theological understanding is. God wants us to realize that all these wonderful fruits of your ministry is just but God's grace. We should learn to realize as ministers of the world that we are only instrument in God's plan. And Paul knew that fully. And that is why there is a joy in Paul's heart that even he faced all this kind of suffering. Jesus became man in their suffering, was humiliated, maltreated, accused falsely, persecuted even to the point of death. So that you and me might have eternal life and might have joy in our heart. So that when the time comes in the midst of suffering, we will endure persecution 
because we know it is for God's glory. Finally, preach the word in the midst of suffering because the Lord Jesus will stand with you when the time comes. And having withstand those trials, there is a laid up for you a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to you on that day when Jesus Christ returns. And even this crown of righteousness that will be given to us on that day is just but given by grace and not the product of our works. And knowing that this crown is by grace, then out of thanksgiving, out of our reverence, we will throw back again this crown of righteousness on the foot of the throne of God. And we will bow down and worship the righteous judge, Jesus Christ. And we will say, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty. Let's pray. Father God, let this truth be in our heart that we remain faithful even in the times of suffering because all our suffering is for a purpose and that purpose is for your glory and for our good. Lord, let this truth be remain in our heart for this week to be our guide and so that we may walk worthy to your calling. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.